This morning scripture reading is from Isaiah 53, verses 4 to 12. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressions. This is the word of the Lord. Well, you can tell by all the purple adornments that the linen season has officially started. In fact, it started Wednesday, and I know many celebrated Wednesday as Ash Wednesday, which began the 40 days of Lent, not counting Sundays. Well, I believe that most of us know something about Lent. We may recognize Lent as the period of time before Easter on the church calendar. Or we may know people who observed the Lenten season by fasting, by giving up one of their favorite food items, or possibly giving up their favorite entertainment for a few weeks. Or some, they set aside a special amount of money to give away to a special charity or maybe a special cause. Well, in preparation for Easter, you might well see Lent as a time of emptying oneself and also filling our lives. I truly believe that the very movements of our Lord's Day worship service also is a good representative of the season of Lent. Because you see, we gather and we begin our worship with the approach to God, preparing and praying and singing through confession, through forgiveness, and through praise. And then, of course, proclaiming and reading God's word. All expressing the emptying as well as the filling of oneself, just like the preparation of the Lenten season. We become empty of sin through God's forgiveness. It's all about grace. Yes, the role of confession and the role of self-examination should play a prominent role during the Lenten season as well as during our gathering times of worship. If you listen to the Christian radio stations, you probably have heard of Pastor Chuck Swindoll. Well, on one of his broadcasts, he recalled his last spanking when he turned 13 years old. He said, Having just broken into the sophisticated ranks of the teen world, I thought I was something on a stick. 
My father wasn't nearly as impressed as I was with my great importance and my newfound independence. I was lying on my bed. My father, he was outside my window on a muggy October afternoon in Houston, Texas, weeding the garden. He said, Charles, come out and help me weed the garden. I said something like, no, it's my birthday, remember? Well, my tone was very sassy and my deliberate lack of respect was quite eloquent. I knew better than to disobey my dad. But after all, I was the ripe old age of 13. Well, I believe that my dad set a new 100-meter world record that afternoon. He was in that house in a flash and over me like white on rice, spanking me all the way out to the garden. And as I recall, I weeded until the moonlight was shining on the pansies. Well, that same night, he took me out to a surprise dinner. He had given me what I deserved earlier, and later, he gave me what I did not deserve. The birthday dinner was a matter of grace. He showered his favor on this rebellious young man, and I enjoyed grace. Grace defined getting something we do not deserve. Another way to say it is that grace is the unmerited, undeserved favor from God. And I truly believe that understanding the grace of God is crucial for us to experience the abundant life that Jesus desires for us. This morning's sermon scripture can be found in the Gospel of John in chapter 19. And in this 19th chapter of John, we're going to be looking at verses 14 through 18. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can freely gather and worship you. We thank you too, Lord, that we can open your word and proclaim it. We pray, Lord, that during this time, that we won't just read it and proclaim it for head knowledge, no. Do you, by the power of your Spirit, would use it for transforming knowledge within our hearts so that we may become more like your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. A reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 19, verses 14 through 18. Now, as the day of preparation of the Passover, it was about the sixth hour, he, Pilate, said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. For he delivered him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of a skull which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, and Jesus between them. This is the word of the Lord. Now by now, I bet you, you got a good indication by the songs we sang, by all of the reciting that we've done, that our sermon title is, It's All About Grace. Just outside of Jerusalem, on the road leading into the Holy City, is a place called the Skull. Now the Romans, they used this highly visible place to make an example to the people by doing many executions. The condemned man was forced many times to carry his own cross along that main street to his own execution, to that site, all as a warning for all the people to see and to watch. Now, crucifixion was an ugly and painful and slow death by suffocation because, you see, the weight of one's own body caused the blood and the water to surround their hearts and to fill their lungs so that that person could no longer breathe and they would actually drown in their own fluids. Well, today, 
we're going to go back to the things leading up to the arrest, the trial, as well as the crucifixion of Jesus. Now, there were several things these Jewish leaders, the Pharisees, along with the people at the temple and all the religious teachers, along with even the temple guards, and of course, all the priests, right, accused Jesus of doing. They said that he had broken their laws. They and their witnesses, though, could not agree on any of those laws of which that he broke. And they couldn't even prove that Jesus had actually broken any of those laws. But Jesus, he did confess that he was guilty of three things. Now first, Jesus confessed that he was guilty of healing on the Sabbath. Now you remember the story found in the Gospel of Mark in chapter 3. And I'd like to read it to you, beginning with verse 1. Mark 3, 1. Again, Jesus entered the synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand. And they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man with the withered hand, Come here. And he said to them, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill? But they were silent, and he looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, and said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. Now, I find it very interesting that Mark describes Jesus here as getting angry here with the Pharisees. Now, Jesus knew their hard hearts, and Jesus could see their uncaring attitudes. Now, anger itself is not wrong. Because, you see, it depends upon what we do with our anger that makes it right or makes it wrong. Now, we can get angry at someone, and we can talk about them, and we can criticize them, and we can express that anger in selfish and destructive and harmful ways. Or we can take that anger, and we can use all of that energy to possibly correct a problem and to be a part of a constructive solution rather than tearing people down. I find it interesting in Matthew's Gospel, in the 12th chapter, beginning with verse 11, Jesus says this about this same situation. Jesus says, Which one of you has a sheep? If it falls in a pit on the Sabbath, will not take hold of it and lift it out? Of how much more value is a man than a sheep? So it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath? And then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And the man stretched it out, and it was restored, healthy like the other. But the Pharisees went out and inspired against him how to destroy him. Jesus, he heals the deformed. Jesus heals and makes normal again the broken the shattered, the damaged, the ruined, the destroyed, the defeated, the lost, the abandoned, and the crushed. He restores the dispirited and the withered lives along with withered hands. But the Pharisees, along with the Jews, were adamant about their church and their religious traditions. To them, keeping the Old Testament laws was much more important than changing lives and actually helping people. Yes, they just couldn't get the concept of grace. But many believers expected the Messiah to do miracles and, and signs. So because of that, they then began to follow him. We read also in this Gospel of John in the seventh chapter, it says that the Pharisees heard the crowd muttering these things about him. And the chief priests and the Pharisees sent officers to arrest him. But they did not arrest him at that time. Because it was not yet his time. 
But later, when Jesus did stand trial, they accused him of many things that were unlawful. And they could not prove any one crime. They could not prove any one fault, any one sin. So yes, Jesus, he confessed to healing on the Sabbath. But it's all about grace. The second thing Jesus confessed that he was guilty of was being a friend of sinners. And I believe that you also all are very aware of this story as well. Now it's another Sabbath day. And Jesus once again is in the synagogue teaching. In the crowd they soon gathered and they sat down as he started to teach them. Now again, the enemies of Jesus, they were trying to trap him into saying or to doing something that they could possibly use against him. So what did they do? They brought before Jesus a situation that by law, the mandatory penalty for this crime required that that person be stoned. Again, in the 8th chapter of John, as Jesus was speaking, the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery and placing her in their midst. Now they made her stand before this big crowd. And the accusers of this woman, they quoted the Bible and they read the law of Moses. And they kept insisting that Jesus must condemn this sinner. They demanded him for a response. An answer from Jesus. What do you say to this, Jesus? <laughs> Just think about all of the whispers that probably was taking place. Think of those looks and the secret talking behind the back and all the judging and the finger pointing that was going on within that worship service. Think about how much negative energy must have been at that worship service. Jesus once said, first take that log out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. It is still that way today, is it not? Because you see, there are a lot of log-eyed Christians in this world who seem to spend way too much time and way too much energy on putting other people down instead of lifting other people up. Yes, Christ was teaching them that they can, in fact, be friends with sinners. So Jesus, he stood up and he says to them, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. Well, by doing so, Jesus could not be accused of being against the law. But by saying that only a sinless person could throw the first stone, Jesus gave the perfect example of true compassion and true forgiveness. And when these accusers heard this, they slipped out one by one. From the oldest to the youngest, every person within that room, within that place of worship, was able to understand the message of Jesus. And then finally, Jesus, he was left there in that room with that woman. And Jesus stood up and he says to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? And she said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go. From now on, sin no more. Well, the Pharisees, along with those temple leaders, accused Jesus of many false claims. And when Jesus stood on trial, though they accused him of being unlawful, they again, they could not prove any crime or any fault in him. So yes, another thing that Jesus was guilty of was being a friend of sinners because it's all about grace. That day they tried to have Jesus arrested, but once again, 
Jesus was not arrested because his time had not yet come. Finally, the third thing that Jesus confessed that he was guilty of was this. He claimed to be the Son of God. Now once again on the Sabbath, Jesus is in the synagogue and he's teaching. And religious leaders, they surround Jesus in the temple. But only this time, Jesus is the one at the center of the crowd. The Jewish leaders pick stones up to kill Jesus. The charge is making himself a God. We read in this 10th chapter of the Gospel of John, beginning with verse 31, the Jews picked up stones again to stone Jesus. And Jesus answered them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you going to stone me? The Jews answered him, It is not for a good work that we are going to stone you, but for blasphemy. Because you, being a man, make yourself God. Now Franklin Graham he said that being born the son of Billy Graham did not make him a Christian. Just like being raised in a church, the prayers of your parents or grandparents or great-grandparents, nor memorizing scripture, nor doing good deeds. No, none of these things make you a Christian. But it takes complete and total surrender of your life to Jesus, confessing and repenting of your sins, asking God to forgive you, and finally, Trusting Jesus as your personal Savior and Lord. And only then will you become a Christian. Only then are you born again through the life-giving work of the Holy Spirit. Now over in Matthew, in chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, beginning with verse 21. Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven, on that day many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Now Jesus, he exposed these people who surrounded him with religion. And he said, you have to have a personal relationship with me, Jesus. On that day, the final day of judgment, only our personal relationship with Christ only our acceptance of him as Savior and our obedience to him will matter. Now many people believe that, oh, they are good people and they say all the right religious things and they do all of the right religious things. And they will be rewarded with eternal life. But in reality, faith in Christ is what will count at that day of judgment. That day of judgment is the final day of reckoning when God will settle all accounts, judging all sin and rewarding faith. So yes, Jesus showed us how we should treat others. Yes, Jesus showed us the man's religion is not as important as a relationship. Jesus showed us how to be radical. Because he healed on the Sabbath. Because he was a friend of sinners. Because yes, he claimed to be the Son of God. But when Jesus stood before Pilate on trial, he proved that he was who he said he was. Jesus was not guilty of breaking any laws. Jesus was not guilty of committing any sins but he was guilty of healing on the Sabbath. He was guilty of being a friend of sinners. And he was guilty 
of being the Son of God. Jesus offered proof on that cross. He offered proof when he transferred the sins of the entire world my sins and your sins, unto himself on that cross. Jesus' grace is sufficient. And yes, it's all about grace. So let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for loving us in spite of our sinfulness. We thank you, Lord, for giving your only begotten Son so that we could have a relationship with you. And Lord, we pray that if there's anyone that is here today or listening to this by way of the internet that doesn't have that personal relationship with you, that today would be the day that you would indwell them by the Holy Spirit and bring them into your kingdom. Lord, we all deserve judgment and none of us deserve your grace. But yet you sent your only son who freely came and gave his life for us as payment for our debt. Thank you, Lord, for your grace in whose name we pray. Amen.